Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Wong with the Illinois Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics, and I thank you for joining us for today's webinar on perspectives on vaccine hesitancy. Before we begin, I would just like to go over a few things. This is our webinar planning group and nobody on the planning group the content reviewers or CME application reviewers had any disclosures. The CME accreditation statement is here. Everyone who completes the evaluation afterwards will be receiving one hour of continuing education and nurse and nurse practitioners can submit certificates of attendance to their accrediting board for credit for participation in the live webinars. Funding for this webinar is provided by the Chicago Department of Public Health. And um, we did have a conflict of resolution for this, um, for a disclosure, and this is just to show that the presentation was reviewed and determined that there was no commercial bias and did not refer to any manufacturer names. And then lastly, I wanted everyone to know that all participant phone lines are muted, that this webinar is being recorded. After the presentation, everyone will receive a copy of the PowerPoint slides in a PDF format, a link to complete the evaluation, and a link to the recording of the webinar by the end of business day. If you have any questions for our speaker during the presentation, please enter them into the question box on your control panel for the webinar located on the right-hand side of your screen, and your question will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today, we are joined by Dr. Gary Marshall from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, Dr. Marielle Frischone from the Chicago Department of Public Health will be introducing him. Okay, Dr. Frischone, you can go on. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our measles webinar series. Uh, and I want to thank ICAP for um, getting some incredible speakers uh, over the past week. I'm thrilled to be able to present uh, Dr. Gary Marshall to give us the one of the best talks on uh, vaccine hesitancy that I've heard to date. <laughs> um, he has many accomplishments. He did med school and peds residency at Vanderbilt University and pediatric ID fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he's now professor of pediatrics and chief of the division of pediatric infectious diseases at University of Louisville. In 2018, Dr. Marshall received the Plotkin Lecture in Vaccinology Award from the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. And this is a very uh, important award given uh, for contributions to the field of vaccinology or areas of related science that have impacted the lives of children and the specific area uh, of pediatric infectious diseases. I was lucky enough to hear Dr. Marshall uh, give this lecture during the ID Week conference last year. And as the immunization program director, I hear many, many talks on vaccine hesitancy, and I've been asked to give many talks on vaccine hesitancy. And his perspectives uh, and, and the philosophical tools that he used to present the information were the most compelling. Um, again, that I have heard to date. And that's why I begged my mentor, Dr. Ellen Chadwick, to introduce me to him uh, at the conference. And I was lucky enough to twist his arm to come talk to us today. So I want to thank him again for being here and making time um, for the Illinois chapter. And I want to, everyone can give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Gary Marshall. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Frischan. Um Dr. Marshall, I'm going to go ahead now and transfer over the presenter mode to you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Anne, and thank you, Marielle, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not sure I'm up to all of that. Um, I have to say that this is a topic I've thought long and hard about, and um, I maybe have some unique perspectives. Although I'm not a psychologist, I do play one on TV. 
And I also see a lot of patients. And I, I think the more patients you see and the more you deal with vaccine hesitancy, the more you're able to gain some insights into why it happens. And so I hope to share some of that um, with you today. And I hope we have time at the end for, uh, for questions and comments from the audience. As uh, Anne mentioned, I do have some potential conflicts of interest. Those are shown on this slide. Um, and I do not intend to discuss unapproved or investigational uses of any commercial products in the presentation. Um, and as Anne mentioned, the presentation was reviewed and apparently I am free of conflict uh, or bias. I think I am still conflicted though, and that's why I'm in therapy. But anyway, um, I hope after the, uh, at the completion of this um, uh, activity, you will uh, be able to address some of the thought patterns that lead to vaccine hesitancy and ultimately be able to maintain good, robust vaccine coverage in the face of pervasive anti-vaccinationism. And so, um, <clears throat> Hit the wrong button there. There we go. Okay, so uh, I just want to kind of um, frame the discussion a little bit by talking <clears throat> about the history of vaccinology. It all begins really in 1796 when Jenner inoculates James Phipps, James Phipps, and prevents him from getting smallpox by inoculating him with cowpox. Between then and 1954 was an era of uh, discovery where we learned about microorganisms, we learned about the immune system and <clears throat> how we defend ourselves against infection and really developed much of the science of vaccinology. And in 1954, that came to fruition with the Salk vaccine trials, which involved a million point four children throughout the country. And of course, um, uh, those trials demonstrated that the Salk vaccine worked. And so this ushered in a golden age of vaccinology. And um, I like to set the stage by showing this picture, which is a picture of children who are all standing in line, smiling with their sleeves rolled up, happy to be participants in the Salk vaccine trial. They were happy, well, because one, they were gonna get a lollipop, um, <clears throat> number two, they were going to get a polio pioneer button, but number three, they were going to get a shot. Even though they didn't really know if the shot was SOC or placebo, they were still happy because they knew the alternative was the risk of polio and, and the possibility of spending the rest of your life in an iron lung. The, this is a, uh, a, an illustration of the exponential growth in vaccine preventable disease. So um, each of the vaccines that are shown on this slide were not preventable until the vaccine was, uh, was created. And you can see here beginning with polio and measles, mumps, and rubella, and going through hepatitis A, varicella, and even most recently cervical cancer and herpes zoster. But there were also technological advances that occurred during this golden age. Now, just as one example, we learned that uh, if you take the polysaccharide capsule of a bacterium like Haemophilus uh, and you hook it up to a protein, you can create a much better immunogen than the polysaccharide alone. And that's able to induce better immune responses and um, overcome the innate difficulty that infants have in responding to polysaccharide antigens. And you can see the list here of all of these other technological advances, things like virus-like particles. That's what the HPV vaccine is. It's a protein that <clears throat> self-assembles into little particles that look just like an HPV virus, except that they have no DNA, they can't replicate, but they're very strong antigens. We've learned more about adjuvants and how to improve the immune response. And then even things like manufacturing and quality control, all of these things are uh, advances during the golden age. There were also programmatic advances. So <clears throat> um, disease surveillance became much better. The economic analyses that we do to determine 
should a vaccine be used routinely? And if so, who should get it? And what will be the cost benefit of doing that? Safety monitoring is a completely different thing than it was even 30 or 40 years ago, because now it's done in real time. So the vaccine safety data link hooks into claims databases that cover millions of, of, of lives. And <clears throat> these computer algorithms are able to look continuously for problems that might arise uh, from using vaccines. Even the, the process of doing clinical trials is, is different and, and the, the science of clinical trials has become much more rig rigorous. So the impact of all of these advances is very obvious. If you look at the, <clears throat> the US from 1994 to 2013, by routinely using childhood vaccines, there were 322 million cases of disease prevented, 21 million hospitalizations, three quarters of a million premature deaths prevented, and a net savings to society of $1.4 trillion. And that is assuming a birth cohort of 4 million every year, and it doesn't include vaccines like influenza, and hepatitis A. There have also been epic successes. Um, all of you know that smallpox has been eradicated from the face of the earth. It only exists now in, in uh, two laboratory vials, one in Russia and one in the United States, that we know of. But did you know that another virus has been eradicated from the face of the earth, and that is type 2 polio? So, uh, you know, there's three types of polio, and type two is the one that replicates um, the best. And uh, the last case of type two polio that occurred anywhere on Earth was in 1999. And so the Earth has now been declared free of type two polio, and hopefully types one and three are on the chopping block. Measles has been eliminated from the Americas and rubella as well. Now, it's a little bit confusing because I said eliminated from the Americas. Well, how can we have this outbreak of measles? Well, it has to do with the definition of, of elimination. So <clears throat> whereas we are having cases, we are not having concentric rings of transmission that, you know, generations of transmission in the community, which would mean that measles is endemic. By the way, we are getting to the point where we may be endemic again. I want to say a few other things, though, about this golden age of vaccinology. It was a time of science-mindedness. Uh, I grew up during this period of time. Um, you know, it's a time when the atom was split and the DNA code was deciphered, and we landed men on the moon. By the way, that was 50 years ago, almost exactly to the day. I watched the CNN special the other night on the Apollo 11, and it just brought back memories because I remember following that religiously and cutting out the articles in the newspaper. People in our generation were about science and we saw science as a way to further mankind. These people were, were folk heroes, right? Um, <clears throat> um, Salk on the, on the left and Sabin on the right. And I would argue, though, that everything changed in 1998. And that's when Wakefield published his now infamous paper in The Lancet claiming that the MMR vaccine caused autism. Now, a couple things to say about this. One is <clears throat> um, vaccine hesitancy was not a new thing in 1998. So even going back to the 70s and 80s where parents were afraid of the whole cell pertussis vaccine, even going back to Jenner's time, when they were afraid to take the cowpox because they thought that they would uh, begin to sprout parts of cows out of their bodies. But 1998 was a pivot point because it was just at the beginning of the availability of mass information through the internet. And, um, and it, it really did launch a modern wave of anti-vaccinationism. The other thing I want to say about Wakefield's paper is that it was fraudulent. Now, I didn't say it was a mistake, and I didn't say that subsequent studies have shown that it was an error. I said that it was fraudulent because it was. 
And that has been shown now that the information that was published in this paper differed from what was actually in the medical records. And the rest is, of course, history. But, you know, it's uh, my friend Paul Offit says it's like, yeah, it's like saying fire in the middle of a busy theater and people start running for the exits. But if you then retract the statement, there is no fire. People are still running for the exits. And so Wakefield's paper really did launch this new anti-vaccinationism. And you can see here examples of front page news articles in the lay press about vaccines and are they dangerous and what is the truth about vaccines. Well, the truth is that um, most parents are still concerned about serious adverse events. Um, in New York State, you can see here in the center, I don't know if you can see my little pointer there, but anyway, um, the uh, in New York State, a quarter of infants are following an alternative schedule. And what does that mean? That means a schedule that their mother and dad made up, not the schedule that the CDC publishes, but one that they just decide that they want to do. And that's concerning to me, but what's even more concerning is when you ask physicians, are you willing to accept an alternative schedule? Three quarters of them say yes, and that's shown here in the green. And it's alarming to me because alternative schedules have not been tested. Uh, the vaccines we use are used on schedule because that's how they were studied. Pediatricians in the US are more and more seeing families that are refusing vaccines. If you look at the AAP's periodic survey, you can see from 2006 to 2013 that the percentage of pediatricians who are encountering refusal has gone up. And on the right here, it shows you some of the reasons for the refusal. The vaccines are not necessary, they're not safe, I'm worried about thimerosal, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you look at a heat map of non-medical exemptions, which is a proxy for vaccine hesitancy and refusal, you can see that we have some areas of the country that are very intense um, in terms of exemption rates. Uh, I would say that um, Chicago being right here is very close to um, a area of a high concentration of exemptors, and then places like Washington State, et cetera. So it's not hard to understand then, uh, you know, if you look at the states out west, I'll make the analogy of these forests that have not burned in many, many generations that are now just tinder waiting for a lightning strike. And that's what we have when we have large numbers of exemptors living in the same area, waiting for that lightning strike of an importation of measles. I don't have to tell you that measles um, <clears throat> is back. The case count now is, is well over a thousand, and this is the most we've seen in decades. There's really only one reason for that, and that is that, that there are kids who are not being vaccinated. So um, these are reports of measles cases in the US by year, and you can see here, uh, this was, oh gosh, I guess a few weeks ago, where we had 1,044 cases. And then um, you can see here where reported cases of measles have occurred in the first half of this year. Um, and you can see that um, Illinois is on that, that list. Just to give you a few details, um, there have been nine cases in 2019. Four of those were in Champaign County, two in DeKalb County, and you can see the others here. Um, five of the nine cases were unvaccinated people. And in three of the cases, there was the report of only having received one dose of vaccine. And then just to not underestimate the impact of these cases, here are data from your health department that show the number of contacts and the number of potential susceptibles. Um, for example, in Champaign County, 1,200 potential direct contacts of the cases, 41 susceptible contacts who had to be monitored, and 58 healthcare-related contacts. So the, the downstream effort and costs involved with these cases is really tremendous. And just to make the point again, why is this happening? The 
the bluish dark colored columns here show you the the um, proportion of the measles outbreaks in the U.S. that are related to unvaccinated status. This is like, duh, of course that's why we have outbreaks, because if everyone were immunized properly with two doses of vaccine, we would not have outbreaks. So it doesn't make any sense, right? We've come so far in our ability to prevent disease through vaccination, and the vaccines are demonstrably safe and effective. Why are people not wanting to get vaccinated? And this is what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. I've tried to sort of think of it in three levels. One is the level of the facts on the ground, the truth, the actual data that we have to deal with. The next level is the culture and the times in which we are living. And the third level is the level of the human mind. And what are the characteristics of the human mind that make us susceptible to something like anti-vaccinationism? And we'll run through this first thinking kind of on the part of the parent. So one of the facts that we have to address is that there is misinformation on the internet. All you have to do is search dangers of vaccination or even just search the word vaccines and you'll come up with thousands and thousands of hits the majority of which will be anti-vaccine websites. And so it's very easy for a parent to find this, quote, information on the internet and to come to the provider saying, listen, I, I read about this autism stuff. I'm a little bit worried about that. Then we have to look at the culture in which the parent is living. And that is arguably a culture of anti-science. This is a culture where we can look at the exact same glacier in 1921 and 2009. The, the evidence staring us in the face and still believe that there is no global warming. This is really would have been unimaginable back in the 60s and 70s when we were more about science. And so, we go from, I read that vaccines cause autism to, hey, don't, don't tell me about the science because look, science isn't always right. And then we get down to the level of how the human mind works. And that is, you know, we work through anecdotal thinking, right? Um, so to borrow an analogy from Paul Offit, um, <clears throat> if we think about people who have an exposure and people who have an outcome, when we see that an outcome occurs in a person who's exposed, we, we think there might be a relationship, right? So I got the vaccine, I developed autism, box A, there must be a relationship. But we don't often think much about the other three boxes. So what about I got the vaccine and I didn't get autism? Or I do have autism, but I was never vaccinated. And you can see that you really need to look at all four boxes to, to, to make any sense out of it, to test the hypothesis. But we tend to focus on box A. That's why it's highlighted here in yellow. And, and we focus in box, on box A because that's how we evolved. We noticed relationships between things, and that's how we were able to be fit in evolution. But it kind of works against us here because we go from, I read that vaccines cause autism to science isn't always right to, you know what? I heard about this case and that's enough for me. No vaccines for my child. Let's, let's give another illustration. One of the facts that we have to deal with is that adverse events actually do happen. Fortunately, they're very rare. So this is a listing of known adverse events from vaccination. One in a million doses is going to cause anaphylaxis. Intussusception does occur with the current rotavirus vaccines, probably somewhere around one in, uh, one in the 20,000 to one maybe in 100,000. MMR can give you immune thrombocytopenic purpura, one in 40,000 doses, usually temporary. So this is true, okay? And we have to understand that vaccines can have serious side effects. But we know they're rare. 
then we get to the next level of the culture, which is not just anti-science, but it's actually poor science literacy. And you don't have to believe me, you can look at the results of <clears throat> science achievement exams among 15 year olds, where you can see that the United States has fallen down and continues to fall. If you want your kids to be science literate, um, raise them in Singapore or Japan because they will get a much better science education there. And so it's true that vaccines can have serious side effects, but a parent may not understand the science behind the fact that those side effects are rare. Why don't they understand? Because they don't understand science. And if, if you know, I'm not gonna go belabor this, but you know how science works, right? We come up with a null hypothesis, then we do studies, and those studies either allow us to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. But the problem with this is we can never be 100% sure about anything. The only way to be 100% sure that vaccines don't cause autism is to test every single person who ever got a vaccine and every single person who never got a vaccine and compare the outcomes, which of course is impossible. Everything else we do is an approximation to the truth. So it's really true that they can't prove vaccines are safe. But that's not a failure of science, it's a failure to understand how science works. And then we get back to the human mind, which just like anecdotal thinking also thinks in terms of heuristics. And heuristics are little rules of thumb that help simplify our lives. We can't debate and deliberate over every single decision we make. And so our minds sort of come up with these shortcuts. And those shortcuts can lead to um, the wrong decision about things like vaccines. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the availability heuristic means, you know, I just heard about this thing and, and sort of hearing about it makes it seem more likely. And so, you know, vaccines can have serious side effects and you can't prove to me that vaccines are safe. And Anyway, there was this thing on Oprah the other day about this mom, and she said that the kid was injured by vaccines. That's one case, but in my mind, it makes the event more likely because I just heard about it. Now, these, this kind of paradigm works also in the provider's mind. So the truth that the provider knows is that the vaccine programs have been very successful. Um, if any of you there are younger than me, uh, which would be under 61, um, you probably have seen HIV, but, or probably have not seen HIV. I saw HIV, and that's probably why I went into infectious disease, because I was so intrigued by it. But HIV is gone, and that's because of the vaccine program. So the providers pretty much have not seen a case. And the culture in which the provider is living and growing up is the culture of modern medical training. That is not the culture of paternalism that I grew up in. It is the culture of shared decision-making. Now, I'm not arguing for paternalism, but I am saying that somewhere along the line in encouraging young doctors to partner with our families and take you know, care of their children together, we've also lost a little bit of our authority. Um, you know, we, 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 we don't do this with our cars, right? Um, we bring our car in, and the guy says, you need this, and you're like, okay, fine, how much is it gonna cost me? Because we're not the car experts. Well, in the same way of thinking, the parents are not the vaccine experts, you are. And so I think maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit too far, in this case, maybe to the left. But here are the data. The young doctors and nurses are, are not as vaccine confident as the older ones. So, or I should say the more recent graduates versus the more distant graduates. And so, so if you graduated from medical school in 95 or later, your overall uh, um, belief in vaccine safety and in the efficacy of vaccines is less than 
maybe some of your older peers. So in the parents, in the provider's mind, it goes from I've never seen a case to, you know, I need to partner with this parent. Um, and then we get into the human mind, which is a mind that doesn't do very well about risk perception. So um, here's what we're afraid of, and here's what the real risk is. So uh, we're afraid of shark attacks, right, of which there are 28 every year in the United States. But we're very happy to play with the dogs that are walking by on the street when there are four and a half million dog attacks. So, you know, we're not very good at perceiving what the what the risk is. Um, on 9-11, there were nearly 3,000 people who died. And it's been shown that in the three months following 9-11, there were an additional 1,000 or so deaths. And those were the deaths of people who canceled their plane fight flights in the wake of 9-11 because they were afraid to fly. And they decided to try to drive to their destination and they were killed in a car wreck. But we go from, I've never seen a case to I need a partner, to partner with the parent to, you know, I don't know, maybe the vaccine is riskier than the disease. Another thing about being human is we're not very good with numbers, right? Big numbers and small numbers, they're really hard for us to get our, our minds around. So for example, if we're doing a study to determine if a vaccine doubles the risk of a rare condition in the population, we need to study 1.2 million subjects in a clinical trial in order to detect the doubling of the risk of that condition from one in, two, one in 100,000 to two in 100,000. That's a hard concept for people to understand. Here's another thing about being human. You know, we were successful in evolution because we saw patterns. If we put our little cave encampment near the water, we may survive longer than the ones who are off in the desert because the water has sustenance and, you know, fish. And so we notice that pattern, right? Well, here's a piece of grilled cheese that, that sold on eBay for $28,000 because it shows the face of the Virgin Mary. Or does it? I, I don't know. I mean, in order to test the hypothesis, we would need to have a lot of pieces of grilled cheese, and we would need to determine, you know, is the, if the Blessed Mother is trying to communicate with us through the frying pan, or is she not? And if she's not, then we're just seeing a pattern when one doesn't really exist. We're also guilty of confirmation bias, where we begin with a belief, and then we seek data to support our belief. So you begin with the belief that we're not causing global warming, you're told that the scientists say we are, and you want another opinion. So we kind of have to find our inner Spock, right? We have to change these things on the left to these things on the right. But that ain't gonna happen anytime soon. So in the meantime, I've got a few suggestions. The first is we need to take a stand. We need to take a presumptive approach to immunization. Mom, I've got good news for you today. Your 11 year old girl looks healthy. Everything's great. I've got three shots for her today. We're going to prevent meningitis. We're going to prevent whooping cough and we're going to prevent cancer. Got any questions? Now, that's different from everything looks great, and look, I just wanna check with you, what do you wanna do about the shots today? You see the difference, that's the participatory, but we want the presumptive approach. But my daughter doesn't need a vaccine against an STD. Did, do you not hear what I said? It's a vaccine against cancer. Is there something about cancer you don't understand? Um, you ever seen anybody die of cancer? I did, um, which is true. I watched my mother die of cancer, she was 38. It's not something I would want anybody to have to go through. And if I could prevent it, why wouldn't I prevent it? Well, she's too young to get this shot. Well, I really want her to be protected before she's ever exposed. And by the way, the younger you are, when you get the shot, the better it works. 
yeah, but I don't know, this may open the door to sexual activity. Well, guess what? It will not. The studies show that doesn't happen. Um, another mm, way to think about this is, is to retrain the elephant. So Jonathan Haidt, uh, Haidt in his um, book, The Happiness Hypothesis, talks about the human psyche as being an elephant and a rider. The elephant being the old, intuitive, emotional, automatic, visceral part of our psyche, and the rider being the more recently evolved, rational, deliberative. If you read um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, it's system one and system two, right? Well, um, when we first started dealing with vaccine hesitancy, CDC put out, you know, a, a, uh, a paper, the common misconceptions around vaccines. It didn't work very well because it was targeted to the rider. I think you get more mileage when you go after the elephant. So in this study where they had controls and then a group where they tried to change their views on autism and vaccines by giving them scientific information about that topic versus a group where instead of taking that approach, they talked about the diseases that the vaccines prevent. And the vaccine attitudes changed more in a positive direction when disease was the focus rather than uh, this, the autism correction. We also need to know who we're talking to, right? Parents come in different flavors. Some are advocates, some go along to get along. Uh, there are some though who are really not gonna change their minds no matter what. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But we kind of have to know where the parent's coming from in order to know how to approach them. Part of that, where you're coming from, has to do with what your moral foundation is. And um, there are a number of studies now that show that people kind of live on a spectrum along different moral foundation axes. So for example, um, there are people who are far to one side on the liberty versus oppression axis. Others far to one side on the purity versus degradation axis. Well, these people need to be approached differently because their issues are different. So for example, somebody who's very high on liberty might believe that vaccine mandates are an example of excessive government control, and they may be against that. Whereas somebody who's very high on purity thinking may be against vaccines, not because it's a government mandate, but because the vaccines contain toxins, but the diseases are natural. I hope you appreciate the irony here because uh, here the liberty is what we would associate with the political right and purity with the political left. And yet we have the two in bed together. So there's an interesting sort of um, coming together of the far left and far right in this. Another piece of advice is when we say this in Kentucky, um, you don't wrestle with a pig in the mud because you can't win, you get dirty, and the pig loves it. And what I mean by this is those few percentage of parents that are simply not going to come around and whose ideas are way out there in Area 51, it's just not worth it. Um, Larry, uh, I'm sorry, David Taylor. Uh, was on Larry King Live back in 2008. He was the president of the AAP at the time. Um, I don't know, he may even be on this call. Um, and uh, he went up head to head with Jenny McCarthy, who as you know, is a very well-known anti-vaccinationist. And da David, of course, was very professional and very scientific and very um, articulate, but he lost. And he lost because the of the, the elephants that were listening felt the passion of Jenny McCarthy. The writers that were listening assessed the arguments that Taylor was making. But again, it's the elephant that seems to be in control here. This is just an example of an Area 51 mom who believes the vaccines are brought from aliens and, and, and uh, uh, in black helicopters, et cetera. But that's just her personal belief, right? I don't mean to pick on the moms, by the way. It could be the dad, too. 
But the point is that, um, in my opinion, this we ought to just forget about this because we're not going to make any headway. And, you know, if we just focus on the 99% who are being vaccinated, we will not see those concentric zones of spread of measles throughout the country. And so, fortunately, the National Immunization Survey continues to show that the number of kids who don't get any vaccines is still very, very low. And we know that if a certain percentage are immunized, we're not going to see transmissions. So for measles, for example, the herd immunity threshold is somewhere around 93%. As long as we can get 93% immune, we should not see um, community-wide outbreaks. Another um, piece of advice is to appeal to the social norm. So there was an experiment done where hotel rooms um, were randomized to have this tag, which says, help save the environment, reuse your towels, or join your fellow guests in helping save the environment, reuse your towels. The guests were not, they did not know this was an experiment, but don't you know in the end, the ones who had the tag on the right were more likely to reuse their towels. Now, why is that? It's because people want, in, intrinsically, they want to do what other people are doing. This is um, <laughs> another property of the elephant. It's groupiness. We're groupy kind of beings. And so um, we can use that to our advantage here because there is an in-group, right? The in-group is the vast majority who embrace science and see va vaccination as a means to maintaining health, as opposed to the out-group, which we might imagine as closed-minded outliers subject to groupthink, confirmation bias, and overconfidence in their own expertise. I'm not saying it's good to demonize the outgroup, but what I'm saying is it's a good idea to expand what we mean by the group. And in this case, here's the universal, the, the universal symbol of immunization. I love this umbrella covering everyone. In some ways, we have to elevate the discussion beyond the in-group and the out-group and put it all together in the group of all of us, which, which will all be better off when 93% of us are vaccinated, right? Another point would be we can really use the law here. Um, this is, these three concepts are the legal basis for school mandates. And this stuff works. So in Washington state, all the orange and red here is where the problem has been. In 2010, they passed a law that said, if you're gonna opt out of the vaccines, you have to get counseling and you have to get a signature. And don't you know that the number of exemptions went down after that? So I think that shows you that many people are using these um, exemptions for convenience and that if we just make it more difficult where you really have to justify getting that, um, then we'll see better immunization rates. Um, just a couple final thoughts. One is um, that we need to really stop thinking about industry as as the um, as the devil. Industry is really our friend here and our partner. Of the millions and millions of doses of vaccine given every year, none of them are made by the government or by an academic medical center. They're made by a company. And although we might see companies as only out to increase revenue um, and academia as the pure, you know, increased knowledge people. It's really not true. And there's really a blurring of lines. I know a lot of people in industry who really are all about public health. And by the way, if you wanted to make a lot of money in the pharmaceutical industry, don't make vaccines. It, you, it, you can't, you're not going to make a lot of money that way. Um, it takes about 15 years to develop a vaccine. It costs now upwards of a billion dollars. There are eight failures for every one success. And when you look at the final, the total market in the whole world, so you add up the cost of every single vaccine in the entire world every year, it's about $36 billion. If you add up the cost of just one drug around the world, Humira, 
it's 18 billion. That's one drug out of the thousands of drugs that are available. So the point is, if you want to make money, start a company, make a new statin, convince everybody to take it, and you'll be making a lot more money than if you invent a new vaccine. Here's the good news. If you play Plague online, there is a new way to wipe out humanity, and that is the anti-vaxxer button. So I don't know. I don't play this game, um, but apparently it's about wiping out humanity. There's things like nuclear war and Ebola virus. Well, now anti-vaxxers can actually be enlisted in the fight to wipe out humanity. So that's all the formal uh, discussion that I have, and I hope I hope that that spurred some comments and questions from the listeners. And I guess Anne, I, I will. Um, I don't know if I have to do something here, but I'll let you take over, and and we can go back to uh, answer some questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Um, that was a great presentation, and yes, as. Dr. Marshall just said, um, I'm gonna go ahead now and take some questions for people. So please go ahead and if you have any questions at all, enter them into that question box that should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it is just like right there. Okay, so I actually think I'm getting, oops, sorry, I am getting some questions. So the first one is, um, do you think that medical schools should be addressing this issue now so that future doctors are firm in vaccination? So I, I had a little trouble understanding you, but I think you said medical schools and I guess referencing the curriculum and the training yes. that students and residents are getting. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, there are um, papers that show that we're really doing a poor job of teaching students. But here's the problem. Um, over the years, the mandatory trainings and the mandatory um, uh, curriculum elements have increased, and medical schools and residencies are having to check all those boxes in order to keep their accreditation. Well, I don't think our, um, <clears throat> the, the demands, I don't think the supply of vaccine education has kept up with that. So. I'll admit it, in my own medical school, the three hours of lecture that I used to give to the, to the second year medical students on vaccinology and vaccine practice and anti-vaccinationism were removed from the curriculum. So um, uh, there are people working on this. There's a, there's a program called COVER um, that a colleague of mine, Barb Pahood in um, Kansas City is working on that we hope that we'll be able to roll out to all of the residency programs uh, without charge where they can tap into this online educational program and get their residents up to snuff in terms of vaccine confidence and knowledge. Okay, and then, um, so I'm just gonna kind of combine this question because it seems like a lot of people are having, um, are asking kind of the same thing, but, what is your position on whether or not to accept non-vaccinators into the practice? Great question. I'm not going to answer it, but I am going to give you some of the background. So <clears throat> there's a lot to talk about here in terms of um, not accepting anti-vax families into your practice or dismissing anti-vax parents from your practice. Until 2016, the Academy Pediatrics position was not to dismiss these families, to keep them in your practice, to keep working on them, maybe eventually they'll come around. But in 2016, the language in the statement was changed <coughs> to, in a sense, give license to the pediatrician that if they feel like this vaccine thing is, 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 is one among many things where I don't see eye to eye with this family. It's a poor therapeutic relationship. And I, I, I can't in good conscience continue to take care of these children unless they get vaccinated. 
the academy did say, with certain caveats in terms of not abandoning the patient, et cetera, that, that it is permissible to dismiss these families. But there's a lot to talk about here, right? If you routinely dismiss them and the guy across the street routinely dismisses them, where are they going to go? Are they going to go to a chiropractor? Are they going to go to a shaman? Are they going to go to the practice down the street, which does accept such families? And is that going to overburden that practice with those families? And is it going to create a pocket of susceptible children in the same waiting room? On the other hand, I think it's easy to see where if you don't agree on something as fundamental as vaccines, you're not going to agree on a lot of things. And it's just bad medical practice to not vaccinate. And none of us want to practice bad medicine. So, you know, what we're missing here are the data, right? No one's ever done a study to show what is the outcome of a dismissal policy? Does it result in more immunized children or fewer immunized children? And I could see where the former might be true, where if I have a policy that says, if you don't get vaccinated, you're out of here, maybe eventually the majority of those families will come around to being vaccinated. And I have to tell you, anecdotally, that's what I hear around the country when I talk to pediatricians. But I think every practice is going to have to make it up its own mind on this. I will say that I think it's good for the practice to have a policy, not for the individual doctors within the practice to have a policy. <laughs> Having said that, I just got a call a couple of weeks ago from a, a group of pediatricians in Kentucky in a rural area who are having this debate amongst their providers. And it was funny because I got a call one day from one of the younger providers in the practice who happened to have been a trainee of ours. He was favoring the dismissal policy. And then I got a call the next day from the grandfather of the practice, who's a dear friend and a very well-respected pediatrician who was against the dismissal policy because these children don't have many other places to go in rural Kentucky. So it's really a hard question. But my take, as I look across the country and talk to people, it's about 50-50 in terms of practices with a policy and not with a policy. And my own institution, our clinics, which are safety net clinics in a downtown uh, underserved population area, we do have a dismissal policy. Okay, and then um, what is your um, opinion on like delayed vaccine schedules, alternative schedules? Uh, so they are of no benefit to the child. There are studies that show that spreading the vaccines out does not result in better outcomes uh, in terms of, for example, neuropsychiatric functioning. There is risk. And the risk is that until you get that second or third PCB13, you're not protected against pneumococcal disease. So when asked to spread out the vaccines, that means prioritizing some over others, right? So how do you answer that question? If I'm going to spread them out, which ones do I defer? I think the way to frame that question for the parents is, I'm going to tell you about the diseases. I will describe for you <clears throat> pneumococcal meningitis, whooping cough, et cetera. And you tell me which disease you want your child to be susceptible to until you come back to get the next shot. And you know also what's going to happen, right? They're supposed to come back in two weeks to get the Prevnar or the PCB-13. Sorry, I know the conflict of interest police are going to arrest me. Um, but they're not going to come back because something will happen. The car will break down. The older sibling has to go to violin practice. And therefore, the period of susceptibility to pneumococcal disease will be even longer. And so alternative or spread out schedules have no basis in science. It's not how the vaccines were studied. It's not how they're licensed. And there is only risk and there's no benefit. Okay. And then um, 
This is from someone who says that they've been getting a lot of questions about vaccines interfering with the immune system and causing diseases such as diabetes, which we all know is not true, but what is a good way to respond? Well, this is the so-called immune overload theory, or it also falls into the hygiene hypothesis theory where, um, you know, by preventing diseases in infants, we are predisposing them to autoimmunity and allergy. Um, let's put this into perspective, okay? Um, <clears throat> when you give a DTaP, you are giving at the most five pertussis antigens plus a diphtheria antigen plus a tetanus antigen, okay? That's seven antigens. When your dog licks you, you are exposed to thousands of new antigens. So people don't mind the dog licking them, but they do worry about immune overload from the shot. Again, this makes no biological sense. And in terms of other infections, so-called heterologous infections, which means I got my vaccines, but now I'm more susceptible to um, some other disease, some other infectious disease. There's actually no evidence of that. Um, and in fact, there's evidence in developed countries where it's been shown that vaccination actually reduces the risk of heterologous infection. We don't know exactly how that happens, or it may have to do with some selection bias, like the kids who are being vaccinated are also the ones who are better taken care of and less exposed to other diseases. But um, again, part of this, answering this issue for a parent is to explain the biology to them, but part of it is to put it in perspective and say, look, mom, even if there was a tiny theoretical risk of um, increased asthma later in life or atopic skin disease later in life, let me tell you again what pneumococcal meningitis is like. I can't emphasize this enough. We had a kid, 11-month-old, who was admitted with um, pneumococcal meningitis. She was unvaccinated. The parents were very intelligent, uh, educated. One was a veterinarian, another one was an engineer. And the kid did fine, but when she was recovering, the mother basically broke down and cried when we were in the room on rounds. And she said, I, I feel so bad. I feel like I, 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 I put my child at risk by not being vaccinated. And I want you to forgive me. Who basically said, I really am not the one to be able to forgive you, but I will tell you, I think that you were a victim as well. Your child was a victim of the disease, but you're a victim of the of the misinformation that you thought was true. And, and that's the best way, I think, to frame it for them. Okay, and then what are your thoughts on the CDC proposing vaccination of six to 11 month olds with a single dose of MMR traveling internationally? Well, that is a recommendation and it's, it's an important one. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, it applies to all international travel. The issue is that measles is still endemic in many parts of the world. And there are, man, have you ever been, I mean, okay, the most of you are in Chicago. I mean, just walk through O'Hare at five o'clock in the afternoon. It's unbelievable. It is a melting pot of people. And who knows? I mean, try being an infectious disease guy and walking through O'Hare. I mean, I feel like Sheldon sometimes. I want to put a mask on, but um, but it, you know these vi these diseases are everywhere. And so, the issue with the young infants is we don't immunize them till 12 months of age because the mothers have antibody, and we don't want the mother's antibody to inactivate the vaccine virus. But at the same time, if we know you're at an increased risk of exposure vaccination is something we can do to protect you. And so internationally traveling infants, and by the way, even infants who may be traveling into a hotbed of transmission in the U.S., you know, for example, if you knew your seven-month-old was going to be visiting relatives 
in the Hasidic community in New York State, where there's been a huge outbreak, that is a child who should probably also be vaccinated. But you don't count it as part of the schedule. So, so when they're 12 months, they get their true first dose, and then then they get their booster at at uh, four to six. Okay, and um, I think another one is some children like under a year are getting the MMR vaccine right now, even though they are not traveling. Is this something that um, is recommended right now and is commonly happening? To my knowledge, that is not recommended. Um, now, there may be some special circumstances on a local level, uh, you know, just for example, a big outbreak in a very small community where that's being recommended. But in general, that and and um, Marielle, if you if you want to chime in here, to my knowledge, it is not recommended except for the infant traveling internationally. Yeah, that's correct. We don't have any local recommendation for that, but that's exactly correct. If you were in an outbreak area, that might be something that the public health department recommends. Okay, and I know that we are um, running out of time, but I'm just going to go um, do two more questions really quickly. And um, one of the questions is, how can pediatricians help encourage pro-vaccination feelings in their community? Oh, I think that's a great question. And um, I, I think we have to take the long view here. Um, so one thing they could do is get into the middle schools and into the high schools and talk to the students from a scientific vantage point about the science of vaccinology and, um, and teach them why this is a good thing. I mean, that would be, maybe wouldn't pay off immediately, although there are more and more states now that are allowing teenagers to get vaccinated, even if their parents don't want them vaccinated. Um, another thing to do, I think for those of us who have actually seen the diseases, is to, is to work with your local, maybe your AAP chapter and, and put out some, some videos, put out some public service announcements, talk about what it used to be like to see kids in iron lungs, or talk about what it's like to take care of a child with measles. Or, you know, I, you know I've seen children die from chickenpox um, and measles. Um, so I, I think those are ways to engage the community. Talk to the PTA, have a meeting at school um, for parents, you know, uh, to, to talk and and one of the most important things you can do is just that personal advocacy you know getting up in front of these parents and saying I'm gonna tell you I have two kids and they were vaccinated with all the recommended vaccines at the right time they they came kicking and screaming but they got vaccinated anyway and I think that's what you should do for your children Okay, and this is going to be our last question. And so there's been some discussion right now in Illinois about eliminating religious exemptions. Um, do you think that Illinois should, should eliminate religious exemptions or educate doctors better about what valid exemptions are? I think we should eliminate religious exemptions because First of all, there is no major religion in the world that holds as one of its theological tenets that children or anyone should die unnecessarily or suffer from a disease that can be prevented. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's also no mainstream religion that says we don't want you to vaccinate our are congregants. So the fact that there are these religious exemptions tells me that they're really not so much based on religion, but they're based on other things and they essentially become de facto, quote, uh, philosophical exemptions. So 
you know, that's the first thing. And, <clears throat> um, and you know, we, we recently dealt with this in Kentucky where we had uh, an outbreak of chicken pox in the school where, where students were not getting the varicella vaccine because they objected to the fact that the virus in the vaccine is grown in fetal cell lines. And that's really another whole, another whole um, discussion but I, I bring it up only to make the point that even the Catholic Church has said that this is a moral dilemma using this vaccine. However, the moral imperative to save lives outweighs any sort of you know distant moral transgression that happened you know 60 years ago when these cell lines were created. So I I, I just think that um, th th you know we we can't let's put it this way the thing with religion is i mean we all respect our belief we respect religion and respect what people believe but you know your uh zechariah chaffee said this night 1918 um your right to to sw swing your arms ends where the other person's nose begins so you do have a right to exercise your religion but it's not a completely unfettered right because because as a society and as a country, uh, we do, a society does have a mandate to protect its, its citizens, right? And that's why the courts have upheld um, the school mandates going back for decades. And, and that really has not changed. So, you know, the courts really care more about your responsibilities as a parent than they do care about your rights as a parent. And in this case, your responsibility is to protect your children. And that's why I think that, quote, religious exemption isn't, it's not really a real thing. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Um, I'm still getting more questions, but um, unfortunately, we've already gone like over time with everything. And so I'm going to cut everybody off now, but it, anybody still has like any additional questions, um, please feel free to email me and um, we'll do our best to get it answered either with Dr. Fashone or if Dr. Marshall has any time at all to answer some questions, like please just send those in for later on. But I just wanted to conclude this for everyone and just to let everybody know, um, sorry I meant to be showing this slide during the questions, but just that Complete the evaluation by July 9th. Otherwise, you won't be um, getting your CME certificate or certificate of attendance. And then after that, you'll be receiving your certificates around July 23rd. So thank you so much again, Dr. Marshall. I think that we can tell from all the questions that we were getting that, you know, um, definitely something that people are interested in and have a lot of questions on. And it was really good for everyone get that lively debate. So um, thank you again also to everyone for attending and I hope you attend one of our webinars in the future. Thanks guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you.